So, my name's Matt. Uh, I currently work at Google. I used to work at NASA, which is where I was working when I met Sam. Um, and I like to come by every once in a while and give some industry information to people, um, give some maybe advice in breaking into security engineering as a field, and also steal the resumes of really good engineers that he's putting out of his program. Um, we are hiring many, 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 many security engineers this year. It's possibly reaching triple digits. Um, so I was thinking, what kind of useful information can I bring to uh, a group of people who are kind of early career in cyber itself? Um, and I recalled a talk that I gave to a group of penetration testers who were kind of early field pen testers. And I thought you might be interested in this. So I call this, go ahead, run your own mail server. What are you chicken? Um, is anybody running their own mail server for their email yet? All right. So this talk is a challenge to you to do so. And, and I'm going to explain why. So a little background on myself. Uh, my job title at Google is Chaos Specialist. I do um, incident management and crisis management in the digital forensics and incident response uh, job. So we have a forensics and incident response team. I manage large incidents, suspected breaches, kind of complicated to resolve issues. Uh, and as a secondary role, I do digital forensics, so forensic investigations. Um, I majored in emergency management more years ago than you would probably suspect. And I minored in philosophy, which if anybody here is majoring or minoring in, that's an excellent choice. Uh, philosophy is one of those universally applicable fields. And I used to be a pen tester. I used to break into systems a lot. Uh, I used to break into buildings a lot. <coughs> and uh, when I talked to the other group of pen testers, I've been in defense now for about five years. Um, but it turns out that offense informs defenders, and defense informs the offense. And there are a lot of lessons that you can work from on both. Yeah, offense informs defense often unwillingly, right? Uh, and defense informs offense sometimes accidentally. Um, but one of the things that can be really important to you is to take a look at an, an offensive point of view, try things yourself, and then think about, okay, how would I protect myself from those? Most importantly, you don't want to be a tool jockey. If you learn nothing else from Sam's classes, you should be coming out knowing the fundamentals behind how things work uh, in networking, in hosts, operating systems, web browsers. Um, a tool jockey, otherwise known as a script kitty, skid, griefer, or a lamer, is somebody who can just use tools and do a thing, right? You point and click. Uh, what, AOL is one of the earlier tools that was a point and clicker. Uh, you point and click AOL, you just point and click in Metasploit, and it does a thing. Uh, one of the banes of the forensics industry is people who learn how to use Encase and then say, I'm a forensic analyst now. <laughs> no, you're not. You're an Encase user. Um, and I've seen so many bad forensic jobs done with Encase either you know, make someone guilty when they weren't or let someone off the hook when they were guilty because people don't understand how the things that they're investigating really truly work. So the one thing you've got to come out of all of this with is knowing how things work. So I'll start with a little premise. Running your own mail server is a terrible, stupid, no good, bad idea. In the year 2018, there is no reason possibly to run your own mail server. There are lots of articles about there, and they were particularly popular around the time of the 2016 election, when someone having a private mail server in their basement was like a big political thing. And people were running articles saying, well, Google might spy on you if you have your email there. Yahoo might spy on you. The only way to be secure is to run your own mail server. Did it work for the DNC? Well, no. We can clearly see now that it did not work. And the reason it's a no good, terrible, horrible idea is that email is complicated. People like uh, Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, they have teams of security engineers that they pay good money and hire in good quantity to make sure everything is as tight and secure as possible. You, in your 20-person company with one person doing system administration half-time, do not. And there's pretty good consensus on this. Um, Christopher Sahogian at the time was like the chief technologist for the American Civil Liberties Union. And this was during all of the discussion about the DNC's mail server. And he said sarcastically, yeah, all of that respect that Slate earned with their you should run your own mail server article is just down the drain now. Um, there's a lot of tech consensus that you shouldn't be running your own mail server. Mainly because it's really, really, really not simple. It sounds simple. Send email, get email. Get email, send email. And in the 1970s, that's more or less how it was, because you would UCP it over to your friend's workstation, 
both of you were sysadmins and you were done. But actual modern email delivery looks a little bit more like this. Um, so this is a rough diagram of how to get an email from one server to another. Um, it is incredibly complicated. And so having said that there's no plausibly good reason for anyone sane to run their own mail server in the year 2018, we're all insane people here because we want to go into network security and digital security and forensics. So my challenge to you is discard all of the good advice about not running your own mail server and run one. Not only should you run it, you should try to get equal functionality to what Gmail or Yahoo Mail or MSN would give you. You should use it 100% for your own email. Make sure that you can't get email unless your mail server is up. And even give it to a few friends if they're willing to go along with you. Or give it to a few family members, support it, and keep it up all the time. Why do you think I'm giving you this crazy advice? In particular, why should you use it for your own mail? Anybody want to take a guess? What do you think? Because you'll be really, really, really motivated to make sure that it stays up. You got skin in the game. Thank you. If you're running a mail server on a you know, GCE instance somewhere just to play with it, do you care when it goes down? Do you care if it gets hacked? No. If it's your email. You have skin in the game and you care. And that's going to give you the motivation you need to really secure it well, defend it well, and monitor it well. So take this challenge. Trust me. You should do this. So a little bit of an overview about what you can expect when you do this. I'm going to say when, because I trust that you're all going to do it. Step one, you've got to pick a server and a platform. Right? You've got Windows with Exchange if you have a lot of money. Right? You can pay for all the licenses and things you'll need to run Exchange. Maybe Microsoft even has like free copies for students and things. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So get the free student copies of things if you can. Set it up on Windows. I prefer Linux or Unix. There's not much Unix around anymore. It's really just been eaten by Linux. Um, so a lot of my advice is going to presume Linux. I will tell you, if you want to go for like the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebooks of the world, Linux is a really good, strong fundamental to have. So even if you prefer Windows right now, if you want to do your experimentation under Linux, you're giving yourself kind of an advantage into being able to go big IBM corporate or tech industry corporate, right? Either one. Um, so you got to install your OS. You got to keep it patched. Maybe turn on auto updates. Why would you not turn on auto updates? Kill PowerShell. Kill PowerShell. Right? There's another yes. one. Potentially. Right now. But I if have you... Server 16 set up right now, and I hate PowerShell. But if you kill PowerShell, how do you remote manage it if you stick it in a colo somewhere? Uh, you can run other software. What about when you want to install a software package that relies on PowerShell to do its automation? Uh, I'm trying to debug it right now. So. We'll get into that. Yeah. So you install a patch. You turn on auto updates, maybe. A lot of organizations you'll find leave auto updates off on their mail servers. Why? Because they don't want to crash the mail server, because everyone's depending on it. They don't trust the auto updates. As a pen tester, if you want to get into pen testing, a lot of orgs don't auto update their mail server. That's so stupid. So then you ins install it. You either install Exchange or the Postfix stack on Linux is very popular. Xim is a popular small mail server. Um, I like Postfix because a lot of things that you're going to use later will plug in nicely to Postfix where they'll be a pain in the ass with XM. Sendmail, I think, still exists. I, I want you to hurt, but I don't want you to hurt that bad. So stay away from Sendmail. Um, probably you'll need to enable Pop and IMAP, right? You'll want to be able to download your mail off the mail server somehow. Nobody SSHs in and uses Pine anymore, except for me. Uh, and you'll probably want to disable plain text login unless you want your password to be stiff. You're also going to want to generate some encryption certs, right? Nobody does anything plain text anymore. So you need to generate some TLS certificates. You need to get them installed and signed by a key signature authority somewhere. Um, generate your user accounts. Create a domain name and a mail server record. Anybody know what an MX record is? Yeah? DNS. Yeah, so in DNS, the domain name system, you look up a domain, there's a special kind of record called an MX record. And when you're trying to send mail from anywhere to anywhere, it'll automatically default to the domain and look for the MX record, and it decides what mail server to send it to. And MX is where you configure failover mail servers, which is cool, because if you guys want to partner up on something, you can fail over your mail servers to each other by configuring failover MX records. And then you can snoop each other's mail by continually causing each other's servers to fail. Never did that in a lab. 
So you've done all this stuff, right? At the moment, you still haven't sent or delivered any email yet, but already the attack surface on your machine, operating system exploits if you haven't updated it, if you install a fresh Windows machine, not behind a firewall, you got about 10 minutes before some script takes it over, right? So do it behind a firewall, update it first, and then put it up. Linux is a little better in that capacity, but only because it starts with so many services off. Um, you have mail server exploits. They are still a thing. IMAP and POP server exploits. You have all kinds of things there. And you have a, you're going to be receiving malware very soon, attack vector. Phishing the users and credential theft. You've opened yourself up to all of these attack vectors against any user account that you create. You've also opened yourself up to brute forcing attacks. And if you just install a fresh mail server, it used to be they would all default to be open relays. And then immediately spammers would start hijacking your connection and turning you into an abuse vector. These days, non-send mail, like Postfix and XM and Exchange, will not default to being an open relay. But don't worry. You can easily accidentally configure it to be one. <laughs> so if you mess that up, you will become an abuse vector. So this is the attack surface you start with. As a, an offensive security engineer, that's a pretty attractive set uh, of things. And as a defensive engineer, you're going to need to start cracking these out one by one. So your current operational status? <laughs> you have an MX record. Every spammer in the world now knows you're you. Welcome to hell. So the first thing you're probably going to want to do, yes? Are there any anti-spam uh, software that you recommend? There are. So the first thing you're probably going to want to do, um, I think I even put a couple of them in here, uh, you're going to want spam filters. Free and open source wise, if you're using Linux, um, Spam Assassin is very good. It has good rules. And also, critically, Spam Assassin supports a DNS-based thing called the SORBS, the Spam Open Source Blacklist. Um, it basically, when an email comes into you, you reverse check against a, a list of maintained spammers, and then it shit cans them if they're spam. So, is that a technical term? <laughs> <laughs> it's a term you'll hear quite a lot in security. Uh, my apologies, but even in the best of circumstances, a lot of security engineers aren't particularly linguistically well behaved. Um, so, you want to decide commercial or open source. There are Commercial spam relays like SonicWall and Proofpoint, maybe you can get an evaluation license or a student license for those. Um, those are very commonly used. So if you're gunning to get into like IT administration at a, a big company, knowing the interfaces for these can be pretty useful. Open source wise, I like Spam Assassin for the spam, Clam AV for antivirus, because you can configure your mail server to pass through Clam AV, virus scan everything before delivering it. Um, Interesting note, anybody know what a, a software daemon is? Right? When, you run, when you run a server software, it binds to a local port on the machine. It calls itself a daemon. It's a constantly running service. Um, you're going to have a lot of those running on any operating system you run. A really important note here, most of these things are going to run a bunch of different daemons. Clam AV will run on port 10025. It'll run an inbound filter on port 10026 and it'll run the anti-spam section of itself on 10027. Three ports, three <coughs> firewall holes, and or three places to attack. So what you've done here is you've reduced one attack effect effectiveness. People can no longer send malware through to your users. And you have opened up the following attack vectors. Now you can get exploitation of their filter server. You can get exploitation of their antivirus. You can play games with their virus scanning. Uh, does anybody know what a zip bomb is? No? A zip bomb is a crafted zip file that contains other zip files <coughs> that when you open it, explodes in size to gargantuan proportions. And the best zip bomb I'm aware of is about 39 kilobytes. And when you unzip it, it unwraps to 12 terabytes. Wow. Blows all of the disk space on the system completely away. What's the very first thing anybody did with a zip bomb after they pranked their friends with it? They messed up somebody's antivirus filter that automatically unzips attachments to try to scan them. Zip bombs are still a thing, and AV will still try to unzip things if you configure it to. And as an attacker, if you want to ruin some poor mail admin's day, zip bomb their AV. So you also have denial of service via resource exhaustion, zip bomb, right? And you have a trust relationship with blacklist sources now. If you configure your email server to check against the DNS blacklist, and drop any email, 
that is coming to you that's in the DNS blacklist. <coughs> One of the things I can do as an attacker, for example, say I want to take over a account that you have at, I'm going to make up something, PayPal, right? But I know that while I'm taking over your account at PayPal, PayPal is going to be emailing you failed login alerts. What can I do to attack you in this scenario? I can craft it so that PayPal's SMTP server gets added to the DNS blacklist you depend on, and you will throw away all of their password reset emails. How long does it take them to catch that that's happening? It depends on the blacklist and who you've chosen to trust. Sorbs is really good. I don't think I could pull this trick with Sorbs, but there's a lot of fly-by-night blacklists, and there's a lot of new ones that will pop up claiming to be better than the old ones. So, I mean, it's just one thing to have in your pocket. So minus one attack plus four, not a good record so far. How are we doing? The good news is spam and malware are no longer getting through to your system. The bad news is your email is not getting through to anyone else when you try to send. So we've had this problem on the internet for a long time of spam. And one of the ways that these days people have dealt with spam at the industrial scale, Gmail, Yahoo, Amazon, Microsoft, SendGrid, all of the big email providers, it, there are two things called SPF and DMARC. SPF is sender permitted from. It's a light framework where you configure a DNS record and you say, these are the specific servers that are allowed to send email as me. And then other people's mail servers will check your DNS, see the record, look at the received headers in an email, and if they don't match, they mark it as spam. SPF is really lightweight, and it's also foolable. So we also came up with this heavy system called DMARC. Domain message something validation? Uh, DKIM is a half of the DMARC protocol, and that stands for Domain Key Identified Mail. Together with DKIM and DMARC, you can create a cryptographic system that sets a public key up in your DNS, signs every outgoing email to say, I really did send this email, and then the recipients check the emails as they come in, look at your public key, check them, see if they match, and accept the email. It's much heavier, harder to configure, but a lot better because it's a lot harder to fool. So when you've gotten to this point in your mail server setup and you want to send email to someone with a Yahoo, Gmail, or Microsoft address, they're going to lose like a lot of your email unless you've set up at minimum SPF and hopefully DMARC and DKIM records. So what this does for you, uh, your mail server will become trusted, but Guess what? Remember we talked about DNS? Where did you set up your DNS server? If you just used like Bluehost or somebody to host your DNS, you might find that they don't support a text record. And SPF and DMARC require you to put long freeform text into a text DNS record and publish that in order to work properly. So you might get to this point and find out, dang, I need a new DNS provider. One of the things you might do here is run your own bind server. Berkeley Internet Name Demon, the oldest and most venerable name server in the world. If you actually want better security, maybe DJB DNS, which is a lightweight name server that uh, a guy named DJB has created. You're also going to be doing a lot of learning about cryptography, cryptographic key management, uh, and publishing signing records. You'll be integrating the outbound message signing into the mail server, and you're also going to have to do TLS inline because most mail providers these days don't trust anything that wasn't encrypted end to end. You shouldn't either. And finally, the last thing you're going to run into way down here, if you chose Amazon AWS, Google Cloud, Linode, or a number of other very popular VPC providers to run your server without having to run your own hardware, you're going to find out, as an anti-spam measure, they don't let you send outbound SMTP at all. You have to go through one of the relay providers. Um, Google Cloud, for example, which I'll speak to because I just know it better than the others at the moment. Google Cloud has partnerships with several bulk email providers like SendGrid, where you can have a free account with them, send up to 100,000 mails a month. But you have to configure in your mail server a relay host to go authenticate to SendGrid, send your email through SendGrid to the recipients. It's another bit of complexity that you'll be managing. You could also just get a real physical server and put it in a colo somewhere which will relieve you of that burden, give you different burdens, and require you to be there at 4 in the morning when the hard disk drives. <sighs> so where are we? Oh, I forgot. For the offensive security people, 
while you're creating your relay through, say, SendGrid, you might make a sloppy SPF mistake. I see people make this mistake all the time. When you create an SPF record, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to give a domain name of somebody that can send mail as me. And a lot of people get sloppy and they'll say, well, SendGrid is my mail relay. I can send email and SendGrid can send email as me. So evil people in the audience, how would you abuse this as a spammer? Anybody can be SendGrid because SendGrid relays messages for everyone. So if Alice has configured an SPF record that says SendGrid can send mail as me, I can create a host somewhere, send email through SendGrid and send it as Alice because Alice wasn't specific about which relay to go through or they left it overly broad. So now where we are. You have reduced the attack effect efficacy by nothing, but you can deliver email to other people now, which is good. And you've added maintaining your own DNS, additional complexity around crypto key management, trusted demons that are running to sign messages cryptographically, and a bunch of open SSL dependencies. By the way, whenever there's an open SSL vulnerability, an open SSL is statically compiled into all these other things, you'll be updating all of them. And relay credential management, because in order to send through SendGrid, you'll have to have a username and password with SendGrid to send through them. You have to store that credential somewhere. If you change it, you have to change it in the mail server. Where are we in the toothpaste diagram at this point? Is it, this, is, this is terrible. But finally, you've got mail delivery. You can receive it. It's probably not junk or viruses. You can send it, and the person on the other end will receive it. You're probably about 120 hours of work into it by now, but this is a point where you actually start to feel really accomplished. You're like, oh my God, this is awesome. I did all these things and it's a secure system and it's good. But wait, users don't want to use Pop and IMAP with Thunderbird anymore. They want to use their phones to check their mail. They want to use webmail. So now you got to install some kind of webmail server, which is going to require what? Server. A web server, right? Um, Zimbra is a very popular open source webmail server. Squirrel Mail and Roundcube are both very popular. These two are free and very lightweight. Zimbra has a free community version and a paid pro version, which means for you, if you do the f like free community version of Zimbra, you're more likely to then end up going into an environment that has a paid version of Zimbra, and then you can say, oh yeah, I know the ins and outs of Zimbra. So there's a, a little trade-off for you there. You also get to maintain Apache, Nginx, Light HTTPD, or IIS, depending on which mail server you choose. I recommend Apache, because if then if you want to go into you know, a web hosting provider and become one of their sysads, it's going to be Apache on the back end for them. Also, depending on which one of these you choose, you'll be run, running Python, PHP, or Perl with a MySQL database or a Postgres database on the back end, or in a very big company, Oracle, if they're crazy. And they're also going to want to check it from their phones, which means ActiveSync protocol. Zimbra is the only free one up here, I think, that I know supports ActiveSync. I think Roundcube has rudimentary ActiveSync in it these days. So where are we? You reduced attack <laughs> efficacy by nothing, again. And you added Apache web server exploits, LAMP exploits, old PHP exploits, Python exploits, <laughs> writable web dirs, file recursion, vulnerable stuff you fixed, but then it got replaced automatically, and SQL injection, which is a whole other attack class category. You guys have been over SQL injection yet? Oh, you're going to love it. Um, this one in particular, xmlrpc.php, you're going to know that name if you do any Linux administration. WordPress, Drupal, you mentioned Drupal vulnerabilities. I will buy you lunch if that Drupal vulnerability doesn't somehow involve XML RPC. And the fun part about XML RPC is it's a, a default component of many things because it allows automated syndication between services. You probably don't even want it. But if you go in and delete it, the next time your software updates itself, it's going to put it back. And it's going to leave it world writable and, and accessible to everything, and you're going to get exploited. Happens every time. I actually had to go into my own server and make it readable, writable, and executable by nobody, and then set the immutable bit, which you almost never have to use in Unix. I had to set it immutable so WordPress couldn't update it and replace it again. So a moment for password management. 
Um, you probably don't have dual factors uh, on your email if you're running your own server at this point. Who has two factors for their actual email right now? Just three of us? I'm so disappointed. Work only. With your work one? Um, if you have Gmail, I can be, I can guarantee you if you have Gmail, this security key is wonderful. Here's my Bluetooth version of it so that I can use it with my phone. Security keys are like seven bucks at their cheapest and they are the absolute best dual factor solution that we have to date. Um, very, very unfishable. But when you're running your own mail server, if you haven't implemented two factor, you should. I know Zimbra and Roundcube will at least support pin based dual factor where you have an app that shows you six numbers and you type the six numbers as a second factor. They're not as good as like the security key, but nothing is worse than not having a second factor. So anybody that tells you like pin based secure dual factors are insecure, they're technically right. Because I can create a phishing page that fools you into typing your password and your pin. I can replay the pin to your actual email provider, snarf all your email, and then in that 30 seconds deliver your email back to you and act as a man in the middle. But that's still hard. And right now the bar is on the floor. You could raise the bar to your knees and you're doing great. So implementing this dual factor in your own personal mail server is still good. Otherwise, your security regime is basically keep out of my server or don't, uh, you know, whatever you prefer. <laughs> dual factor is critically important these days. You have finally reduced your attack efficacy. You've removed brute forcing and phishing if you have robust dual factors. And luckily, the only added attack surface is you have dependencies on third party libraries that you'll need to be vigilant about updating and or uh, keeping, you know, intact. For example, like Google Authenticator, um, obviously Google doesn't do malicious things with it, right? But um, you have to trust that Google is properly maintaining the Google Authenticator library, right? If you install RSA secure ID keys as your second factor, you are trusting that RSA, the company, is properly handling and maintaining the libraries you depend on now. So that's what I mean by third party auth library dependencies. And then there's other things that you also need to do. Um, you need to tighten file permissions everywhere. You have a web server now. You have file recursion. You have default writable web directories. All great ways to exploit somebody. If you're using Linux, there's a command called set FACL. Has anybody ever heard of it? Set FACL is the Linux um, command. It goes along with get FACL and mod FACL. FACL stands for fine grained access control lists. This is something very few people ever use, and it's a super handy defensive tool. So in Unix, you have basic file permissions. I am the owner, I'm in a group, or I am anyone on the system, right? And you can set read, write, or execute for each. Nine, you know, nine check marks in a box, right? So if I want these five people to have access to something and no one else, I can create a group that those five are in, and I can say this group has access to these things and no one else does. But what if I want those five people to have access to half of it, and those two to have access to all of it. The model breaks down, right? Because I can't make two groups own one file. So one group can own one file. In standard Unix file permissions that were invented in the 70s, fine-grained access control lists allows you to set multiple individual owners, multiple groups, to recurse, to have groups dependent on one another, group nesting. So with a, a fine-grained access control list, I can go into a directory and say, these two people have access to all of these things, these five people have access to these five things, and that one person is a supervisor of all of them. And almost nobody uses FACL. It can be a pain to manage for a large enterprise, but if you're tightening down a web server, a mail server, some software you wrote, a temp directory, where you want the software to be able to write into the temp directory but no one else to be able to read it, this is the way to go. Otherwise, you have to allow everyone read access into that temp directory. So definitely learn FACLs. You also, at this point, might need to do some monitoring, right? You don't have confidence that you haven't been hacked unless you're continually monitoring to see if you've been hacked. So you can learn the exciting world of host and network intrusion detection. HIDS, host intrusion detection system. HIPS, host intrusion prevention system. Very little difference between the two, despite what vendors will try to make you believe. The main difference is that an IPS is capable of taking some sort of protective action. In practical terms, think of AV. Antivirus is a HIDS. It will tell you if there's a virus in a file. 
It's a prevention system if it can quarantine the file, right? That's the difference. So on the network, for example, Snort is a very popular open source network intrusion detection system, NIDS. Snort is only an intrusion detection system. It will tell you, hey, that guy just broke into your server. You should do something about that. It will do nothing to help you. You can put it into a mode called Snort Inline, where you put it in control of your whole network, and then it can drop packets. If you put it in a Snort Inline mode, you can do prevention. You can do HIPS. There are lots of products like McAfee Sidewinder that can do HIPS. Um, pretty much all of the Juniper, all of the big vendors have this mode. Strong consideration, though. If you put your device into HIPS mode, host intrusion prevention mode, as an attacker, I'm going to try to figure out ways to mess with you with it. Uh, I'm going to trick it via domain name tricks into making you drop your own traffic until you disable it, right? There are things that I can do as soon as your HIPS begins snarfing packets and actually taking action on them. And even in detection mode, there's occasionally the vulnerability. I, I, it was at least 10 years ago that Snort had a vulnerability where if you sent a certain crafted packet, you could overflow Snort and then end up with a shell on the person's intrusion detection system. If you have a shell on the intrusion detection box, you're doing great as a pen tester. <laughs> Solid job. Nagios, uh, where are we? Yeah, Nagios is a really cool open source network uptime detection thing. It's basic monitoring. So this will help you address when you have your mail server up and it's Thanksgiving and you've gone to your relative's house for Thanksgiving and your email server goes down, how are you going to know about it? You're not checking your email at Thanksgiving, probably. I don't know, maybe. Um, if you have Nagios, you can configure a different server to start monitoring your IMAP, your POP, your SMTP, sending test signals to the SMTP server to see if it gets a response, sending a packet to the HTTP port to see if it gets back an HTTP you know, response, 404, 200, depends on what you do. And you can configure Nagios to start alerting you somehow like emailing to your cell phone's SMS address uh, and let you know that stuff is down. Again, this is mostly useless probably for you as an individual, but if you want to get work in many enterprises, you're going to actually start to find Nagios on the back end of a lot of things. And if they're not using Nagios, they're going to be using a tool that actually works pretty similar to it or, and or bundled it. No, I was just curious what about like solar winds versus solar oh, yeah. winds. What's, what's the industry's been um, Nagios is very popular in the open source world. Um, Charity Majors runs a service, I forget what it's called. It does professional uh, monitoring. Dang, I wish I could remember the name of it right now. I've known it every time like anyone's asked me except for right now. See, SolarWind, I believe, has a free, freebie, lightweight version. Yeah. It also has a nice paid version that, that monitors you know, up top of that, like graphic and all that. Notification. There's lots of versions of these. Essentially, on the back end, what they're going to do is they're going to have service rules, protocol rules, and ways to test them. And if you learn one of them, and you learn it well, and understand how it's doing its checks, that's going to translate to like 80% of the other services. Um, if you look her up on Twitter, Charity Majors, um, look up after the talk what Honeycomb. her services. Honeycomb, thank you. They do real good monitoring. Um, but their platform is a service, so you won't learn how their stuff works you can learn how their interface works and translate that into employment places. Um, but this will help you get down to the guts of it. So where you are at the end of all of this, to, to think about why you went through this, you know what an RFC is? Fundamentals of the internet, request for comment. When you invent a new protocol, you take it to IEEE or you take it to the IA uh, internet authority and you say, behold, I have invented a new protocol. I would like your comments on it. And it goes through a public comment period called the RFC, the Request for Comments. And after all of the engineers who care to comment on it have gone back and forth, weighed it, you know, stomped on the ground a little bit, thrown their opinion at it, if it comes out alive on the other end, it becomes a standard. But the standards are still referred to by their RFC number. Um, I didn't memorize any of the RFC numbers. But at the end of this, SMTP, POP, IMAP, domain name system, TLS, UDP, TCP, and IP, there are dozens of RFCs that you're going to have to get your hands dirty with at the end of this process. And you'll have pretty intimate knowledge of all of them if you go through and struggle through to the end of this. 
you'll have implemented all of those protocols. You'll have interacted with every OS layer from the kernel, where FACL lives, and Intmod, where Snort lives, all the way up to the end user. Um, Active Sync, web protocols up in that layer seven stack. Um, you'll have done system hardening, network hardening, database hardening, web server hardening, and user account hardening. And as you watch the attack surface grow and shrink, you're gonna notice something. If you're on the pen test business, how many weaknesses have you watched fly by in that whole process? When you know the stack super well, how many points in there have you looked and you've like, well, I did my best, but frankly, with what I had to work with, it's the best I could do. You'll know all of those things, so if you wanna get a pen testing gig, you're gonna come back later and you're gonna shred every one of those things that you did the best you could do for. Also, if you wanna practice pen testing, you got a server to do it on now that you have permission to test, because it's yours. And as a defender, you really know where the weaknesses are. You know where you need help. You know where the protocol needs help. All of these things you'll have gotten just from building your own mail server and forcing yourself to have skin in the game. <laughs> and also, uh, pain will make you stronger. So one of the fundamentals of being in the security industry is becoming at peace with banging your head against the wall repeatedly for days on end to try to get to the end of a really difficult problem and then coming out the other side. It's a sensation that's really unpleasant at the start and then you get to used to it and then you get to like it. Going through this process, hitting that pain and coming out the other side over and over again, it's kind of like tempering you for what's to come in the security industry, um, hardening you a little bit. And even more so than that, if you're in the pen test side, and this is one of the points I wanted to make to that group of pen testers and everyone who's going into red teaming, pen testers can kind of be jerks. And the reason is blue team defense is really, 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 really hard. And the red team offense, you gotta have mad skills for, but come on. It's way easier to win as an offensive person than it is as defensive. Uh, the offense has all the time in the world. They can do whatever they want to you. They can hit you while you're sleeping. You have to maintain all of this other crud that goes back to the 1970s and they only have to win once and they're in. You have to be successful every single time. And a lot of pen testers after a few years of winning over and over again, they kind of get an ego about it and they're jerks about it. And so one of the lessons for them is empathy is gonna further your career more than anything else. Understanding how the user feels, understanding how the sysadmin feels, understanding how frustrating all of this crap is on the back end will make you a better pen tester in particular because it will allow you to interact with your clients in a compassionate way that lets you point out where the problems are with their service without being an egotistical jerk about it. Um, but also as a defender, <laughs> just knowing what you've been through helps you to know what other people have been through so that when you come in to pick up a service that you've inherited from someone. The old person left, they hired you, you come in and you look at the stack. The first thing you're gonna wanna say is what? This pile of crap, what a stupid idiot this was. Why did they do all of this crap? After you've been through this, you know what the answer is, right? It's the best I could do at the time with the resources I had available to me is usually the answer for why does this look like this? And so, I think if you go through this experiment, among all of the really valuable technical skills you'll learn, you're gonna learn the empathy skills, the understanding skills that are gonna help you come in and just be more at peace with your life. Like, oh, they're paying me to you know, pick up where this person left off. They had a hard job. Maybe they didn't have as much training as I did. I'll fix it. It beats picking strawberries all day. I'm cool with it. And that's called career longevity right there. So, I'm challenging you to run your own mail server only because a mail server is an example of a fundamental truth. It's right here. At the end of the day, in your career, competence counts. Understanding how the tools work, understanding the guts of TCP IP, understanding all of the little details are what makes you a great engineer. If you're pen testing, vulnerabilities are nice, but they come and go. Understanding how the stuff works is what sticks. And the defender, more than anything else, knows where the cracks are. So if you wanna do offense, do some time in defense. So who's gonna run their own mail server now? Try, who's gonna try? 
Come on, try. I've done it once with Sam. I set up for IPv6 mail server and I sent mail through the Canton College, but you didn't live on it. Give it a go. No, I, I promise. I promise you'll come out better for it. Um, I'm open for QA and I can also talk questions about Google's hiring and what kind of roles we're hiring for and things. How much money is this going to cost? If you go with a free open source solution like Postfix with Spam Assassin and Nagios and all the free things, I don't know, like five dollars a month ish. Yeah, no, be be realistic here. Yeah, like five, five bucks a month ish. You, you want to spend money? If you want to spend money, like you want the Microsoft you have to Exchange spend and all that stuff. No, you don't have to spend anything. No, you really don't. You want to run it in your house, but if you want to run it in the cloud, it's five bucks a month for a digital ocean machine. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you can do so for five bucks a month. You can get DigitalOcean. You can get the bandwidth you need. You can get a free fifty thousand host account with uh, SendGrid. You can run Ubuntu 16.04 with Postfix, Spam Assassin, Clam AV. I mean, I, except for the fact that I run it on physical hardware, I actually am doing this. These are all the things I'm running on my personal mail server. Um, you know, Spam Assassin, Clam AV, Sorbs, all of those are free. Um, I pay a little extra for having my own physical hardware and my own bandwidth for reasons. Uh, but you can do it for five a month off DigitalOcean or I think even a free tier GCE, right? We have free Google Compute instances you can just launch and you can use SendGrid for free. And How long are they free? I don't even remember, to be honest. No, Amazon it's a year. Yeah. I don't recall how long they're free for. Um, but once they're not free anymore, they're still going to only rack you up like five bucks a month or so if you are just doing this with them. Unless you get them compromised and someone Bitcoin mines with them. <laughs> so, gonna, yeah. so don't get pwned. How long would it take to set up? All of this? Yeah. Depends on how well you know the OS fundamentals. If you're learning Linux for the first time at the same time as you're doing all of this, you can make this into like a several month project. Um, if you already know Linux really well, but you've never done a mail server, you can sink maybe 40, 80 hours into it. 120 if you're not lucky. It, it depends on how quickly you grok the running daemons and the connections, how good you are at mining stack exchange for other people's answers to things. Um, but you know, even if you've never touched Linux before, I think those few months are worth it. Because you're going to come out of this if you stick through it to the end. A junior Linux sysadmin, basically. And you look around for junior Linux sysadmin, they're hiring for that. By the way, sysadmin, because you're, you're in security classes right now, right? Um, security industry sometimes gets antsy about like, oh, well, security is so much better than system administration. <laughs> no. I hire, and I love to hire, system administrators for security roles. Because I think competence counts on the fundamentals. And if you really know how all of the systems work well because you've been stuck administering them for years, you're going to be great at security engineering. Especially, I mean, there's this kind of period of professional system administration. And there's this particular gray zone where you've burned out on system administration and you hate the users, but you don't hate computers yet. Yeah. And that's the perfect time to hop over into security engineering. Why would you get stuck on a problem, but you're the only one that, that's running this thing? You won't uh, be the only one running this thing. <laughs> well, how would you get help if you really get stuck on a problem? Do we have, we have a Lisa chapter in the Bay Area, right? Bay Lisa? Um, I don't know Lisa. Lisa's Linux uh, industry system administrators, I think. There's a bunch of groups, meetups for all different things. There's a Usenix meetup. There's Lisa meetups. Um, yeah, there's not even a meetup. There's, there's, there's yeah. There's a there's a bunch of there's a bunch of meetups tech meetups. There's Google is your friend. I was a sysadmin for a while. I use Google all the time. Yeah, Google is definitely your friend uh, because anybody that's running Postfix has had your problem before. I guarantee it. I mean, my server. I spent a lot of time googling things. You know, how did Debian package their spam assassin and why is it storing things in var? Like that was a thing for a while. Um, but like in person help wise, there's definitely local meetups for system administrators where you can go make friends and say like have you had this problem before can you help and most other sysadmins are pretty friendly about it you running any honey pots lately no comment <laughs> if i told you where they were you would exploit them that means oh, you're probably running five right yeah no comment but i have many systems other questions Let's hear about the job. 
so job-wise, we are hiring a lot of uh, people right now in Google security. We have a couple of major areas where we hire in. There's CorpEng, which is the Corp engineering team. And CorpEng has Google security and privacy. Um, we actually do both as kind of a single function organization. So security and privacy is security engineering where we work on intrusion detection, incident response, forensics, systems hardening, network hardening, building monitoring tools, building hardening tools, all kinds of things. And then privacy, we actually have uh, a couple of classes of employee, one of them called privacy engineer. And a privacy engineers learn how all of the software stack works. And then their job is actually to work with engineers to ensure that products are being built with people's privacy in mind. So you would work with like an engineering team and they said, oh, well, we're going to build a tool that will automatically tell people in your phone contact list when you're nearby so you can have parties. And then the privacy engineer goes, <laughs> hold on a moment. Where's the consent for opt-in? Where's masking? Are you going to require real names? Are you going to mask the phone numbers? They get a really good exposure to like privacy law and engineering, and then they incorporate it in products. Security engineer-wise, we are hiring uh, junior security analysts um, into a team called the ATC, Air Traffic Control Team. They triage incoming security incidents before escalating them up to the uh, security IR and forensics team. We're always hiring into SST, the security surveillance team, which is our detection team. They watch intrusion detection systems. They look for alerts. They triage things. Um, the Google security detection team, you've heard of like tier one, tier two, and tier three. They're like tier 2.99. They technically escalate to the incident response team when something's real, but they forensicate, they network forensics, they do full stack service. Um, they're very good. Um, and we're hiring into that team. They also build the detection tools that we run. So we have some very interesting custom tools. GUR is one of them. Uh, I don't know if I can talk about some of the others, uh, but SST builds those. CorpEng is hiring. Uh, level three security engineers in what we just call infrastructure protection. They harden our operating systems, harden new builds of OSs, build monitoring tools on the host. Um, they build all of our signaling for host-based intrusion detection because you can't really anymore intrusion detect on the network because everything's encrypted and it should be. And if you break your own encryption to man in the middle of yourself, you've opened up a huge weakness. So we move all the detection tools down to the host level. And we write our own for the hosts. That's done in infrastructure protection and SecMom tools. Um, also, Chrome browser team is hiring security engineers to do things like PKI, browser hardening. Android is hiring security engineers to do mobile hardening, malware analysis, um, detection on Android. Who else? There's a couple other groups. Those are the, the main ones that I know right now. Um, so I think careers.google.com, if you just search for security engineer or privacy engineer, you'll see all of the like static listings. Um, we're hiring in Mountain View, Sunnyvale, Kirkland, New York, Zurich, Sydney, Chicago, and Bangalore. Do you have any internships? We do have internships. Um, I don't have as much control over Google's internship process as I did at NASA. And so Google tends to only pick interns who are in their master's work. Like for internships, they'll be like, oh, well, if you're in a master's program, come on by. I think they're starting to do um, bachelor's, like four-year internships. Beyond that, I haven't really been able to put anybody in through internship processes yet, uh, mostly direct hires. Can you talk a little bit about the master's um, program students that you've seen at Google as interns, uh, where they're coming from, maybe what they're studying? Yeah, generally they'll be studying computer science because Google pulls heavy from computer science programs. That's not a requirement, that's a trend. Um, in the security org, I'd say only about half of us have comp sci degrees. The other half have no degree or have um, philosophy. Let's see, in my team it's emergency management, philosophy, one of them studied music at Berkeley College of Music, Three of them are computer science, and one of them was biology. So the people that come onto the security program through a master's program, where do they usually come from? Like what universities? I don't really know. I think they're pretty open about which university. I mean, if you're in a master's program and you have decent cyber skills already, and or you have good fundamentals, 
the thing about interviewing at Google in particular is you're not going to get asked like how does it you know use in case to solve a case and you're not going to get asked um, about a particular commercial product you're going to get asked about technology fundamentals how would you I don't know what's a crazy one that we don't actually I have to think of one we don't actually ask people so I don't blow the interview questions um, how would you get good throughput to Mars from Earth right and if you know your networking fundamentals, one of the things you're going to say is, well, you don't do TCP at all because the TCP handshake over a 48 minute round trip is going to fail. You do only UDP. And then we'll ask you, how do you ensure that all of your data gets there? Because UDP is lossy and space is lossy. And what you'll say is, do we have an idea? You don't. <laughs> you do. You send every packet three times with a checksum of the packet, and the OS discards any packet <coughs> seen with a checksum matching that one before. And then by the time all three packets have arrived, you've got at least one good copy of it, and you reassemble them all, mm. for example. So you implement your own TCP. You implement not your own TCP because there's no response. The server on Earth has no idea <coughs> if you've received all the packets or not. You're just playing the odds, and you're discarding all the stuff. Because it turns out to Mars, right? Throughput is not an issue. Latency is. So you can waste two-thirds of your throughput in order to make up for the latency problem. That's the kind of interview question that you'll see, because we're trying to dig and see <coughs> how well do you know the actual stack. TCP, IDP, UDP, um, weird protocols, IPv6. If you come in knowing IPv6, that's a huge help, because like half the people I interview don't know anything about IPv6 at all. And Google has a lot of machines, and we don't have a lot of IPv4. so. We're, we're very IPv6 heavy. So you probably get, they probably interview you like a quiz, like, do you know this, do you know that, do you know this? Typically, like typically we'll do, um, you'll do an interview with five engineers, uh, all of whom are either on the team that you're going to work on or are closely related teams. Usually we ask like a scenario-based open question where, like the one I asked about Mars, where we'll go through your reasoning skills, see how well you know the stack, et cetera. Yeah, but at some point you're going to put say, you're going to make an error, and you're going to know it. Maybe. <laughs> Depends on the error you make. Yeah, uh, so that's a really good question, though, because it speaks to interviewing advice. The three most important words you should know, especially early on in your career, but really all throughout your career, are I don't know. Because if you're interviewing with me and I ask you a question, and I know the answer, and you don't, if you say, I don't know, my response is going to be, OK, well, tell me how you would figure that out. And we're going to go through five or 10 minutes of your reasoning skills. And if I see that you have good troubleshooting and reasoning skills, you're still good. If you bullshit me an answer that doesn't make any sense, that's really not good. So I'm actually kind of glad you said, like, what if you make a mistake? I don't hold mistakes against people as long as it's an honest mistake, right? Uh, if you accidentally call 8021Q 8021G, what do I care? You can Google that. Um, if you don't know how VLANs work at all and you're in for a networking position, that'll be a problem. Right? So minor mistakes, whatever. We care about your reasoning skills and your understanding of the technology stack. Did you have it? Yeah. So for area like disaster recovery, if this is continuity, would that be not part of would it be just infrastructure purely or would it be partially security? Depends on, I mean, it depends on where you choose to focus, right? Um, disaster recovery and continuity planning, if you're focusing on like business continuity, we would probably run that out of the finance org. Um, if you're focused on failover and system reliability, we'd run that out of SRE, site reliability engineering. Those are the Googlers who just make sure everything is up all the time. And the reason why there's very, it's very seldom that you can't get to google.com and it's Google's fault, right? That's the site reliability engineering board. So if you focus on system robustness and reliability, that's engineer or technical program manager in SRE land. Um, if you're a program manager and you're looking at business stuff, like where do we have you know, financial failover if New York gets attacked, right? Mm -hmm. Probably out of the finance work. I think you had your hand up too, yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you have any advice for someone trying to break into IT and security? Breaking into IT and security, yes. Um, Run your own mail server, for, for <laughs> one. Um, so one of the ways that you can break in, in particular if you don't have <laughs> a fancy degree and you don't have a lot of connections already, there are a lot of nonprofits 
that are around the Bay Area especially. They have IT needs, but they're volunteer-based, and they don't really have a lot of ability to be picky about which volunteers they accept, right? They're, they're constantly understaffed, they can't pay. The thing most people don't realize about volunteer organizations and charities in the Bay Area, who makes up the board of directors on most charities? Affluent people in your community. And what are most affluent people in the Bay Area? Where are they involved? Tech. So you go volunteer for your Red Cross chapter, or you go volunteer for you know, the Palo Alto dog shelter, right? And you help them out with their tech needs, and you show them you're awesome at it. One, they might actually have a full-time position open up you can take. But more importantly, you can actually talk to like the, the board of directors people. Oh, what do you do? Oh, you're at Apple. That's cool. I'm trying to break into the tech industry. See all the cool stuff I've done for you. It's a good way to make connections if you don't have a lot. And at worst, you get a bunch of practice on systems that you haven't used before. So it's really not a bad deal. Granted that like, go give away your time for free is not the most practical advice to anybody who <coughs> needs to work or has a family or doesn't have the time. But if you can, that's a route to build those connections. Question. Um, I just graduated from SF State with a computer engineering degree, and I didn't know if you guys have any thoughts on engineering degrees versus um, computer science. And like I said, half of my team's made up of either no degree or definitely not a computer degree. So an engineering degree is great. Electrical engineering, too. Yeah. I mean, we, we actually hire electrical engineers at Google literally to build new circuit boards. Yeah. So yeah, engineering is good. No more questions? I think I might have gone over my time a little too. So on a different topic at a high level, what is Google's secret of success? I mean, in terms of not having had any major security breaches, because I can't remember Google being on your list of articles other than Android that we talk about a lot. But not, not, their not the web. Infrastructure. The only problem with Android is people don't want to it. Yeah. The actual Google infrastructure. Yeah, Pixels do pretty good on Android. What's um, our, our old VP, Eric Gross, used to say that his job as VP of security was to hire the best engineers possible, support them however they need it, and give them the freedom to work. So it's the people. 100% yes. Um, I believe what Eric believed, that if you hire really good, motivated people, and you support them, and you give them the, the freedom to actually address the problems they see occurring in front of them, as opposed to micromanaging, I think that is Google's secret to security success. In your 20% free time that you have at Google, free time, yeah. what do you focus on or what are your interests? So my job for Google is um, incident management, right? Taking care of kind of emergent, <coughs> uncertain situations. My 20% time project for Google is they have loaned me to FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Oh. I do urban search and rescue for large scale disasters. Um, and I work with incident commanders that do four alarm building fires, uh, building collapses, earthquakes, mudslides. My team was deployed to Hurricane Irma to search through uh, debris collapse and find people that were trapped. We've been to Hurricane Katrina. 9-11 was before my time, but the team got sent. You're getting ready to go down to Southern California? I'm getting ready to go down to Southern fire. California, yes. Fires and, fires and rain. Yeah, it's the mudslides will be the problem. Now. But um, I was able to convince my organization that hands-on experience with physical disaster management and search and rescue was a translatable skill to the uncertainty of dealing with intrusions and breaches and, you know, like uh, Spectre and Meltdown, for example. I was Google's incident commander for our response to Spectre and Meltdown because it turns out that, like, that particular vulnerability in terms of response size is not really all that different from, like, a sports stadium collapsing. What if you about browser side security? Like Opera still um, relies on IE and for a proxy. How much more if, um, security updates do you expect, or what do you expect on the browser side? Like either uh, performance or security first, or? Um, I have to say I'm pretty biased in favor of Chrome. <laughs> well, I think there's a flaw with Chrome, wasn't there? I think like it's like your time was wrong. Everything has well, flaws. Um, <laughs> I think the Chrome team does a really good job at preventing and. and but it's not dependent on IE as a, as a proxy. It's a smarter browser, right? Right. Um, Chrome, I think Opera now uses Chromium, which is the open source Chrome underpinning. 
So I don't think uh, Opera uses IE reliably anymore. I think they're down to Chromium. Because I kill updates for IE, and I use Firefox. See, people turn off updates. Smart, no, no, because Firefox is smarter. It doesn't absolutely depend on IE. For I, I love Firefox. I really love Chrome. Um, the one thing that has been top of my mind right now in terms of like Spectre and Meltdown having been released and the fact that JavaScript exploits are such a big thing, the one thing that's been at the top of my mind lately is site isolation, which is the mode in Chrome where you can configure it so that it spawns a new process for every remote site it talks to. Um, it's the only browser that actually fully implements site isolation in such a way that getting your process compromised by JavaScript from a malicious host doesn't expose your login cookie from a different tab. What about <laughs> VMware? Like, you know, I would suggest some to tell people, why don't you just browse in a VMware so it's a little more secure than not infecting your main machine? Is that more of a myth, or you, do you sort of believe that? All security is a trade-off between performance <laughs> and convenience <laughs> on behalf of the user. Yeah. So browsing in two separate virtual machines <clears throat> is only a better solution if your users will reliably do it. Um, so, and I don't believe you can get users to reliably do that. So I, I think the focus has to be on like, Chrome has separate profiles where you can keep your personal life in one and your work life in another. And then it implements site isolation, which is you know the sandboxing between all remote origins. I think that's where the sweet spot lies between convenience and security and performance. Um, you know, if you're in a top secret gov installation, having a separate computer for each of those things is not out of the question, but it's just, where do those trade-offs lie? Yeah, I was thinking of like virtualization uh, firewall. So I'll just put a virtual firewall in after the main computer and then route it route the virtual machine through that firewall. Virtual firewall. That means you've got a kernel stack bridging your interfaces together that I can exploit. <laughs> oh, now you now you tell me which Linux firewall would do you hate or like? I like, just uh, use IP open tables. Sense. Or do you like Indian? Oh, you mean separate, physically separate firewall? PFSense. I really like PFSense a lot. Yeah, everybody uses it. That's why I sort of like OpenSense, because it's, they're like off of yeah. each other. So. I, I like PFSense a little bit more than OpenSense for one main reason. Um, it's a lot easier to convince a small business or a medium-sized business to use PFSense because they provide commercial support, <laughs> which means that if you learn the underlayings of the PFSense box, you're it's more translatable into you know enterprises. Well, Indian also has a business model, like they have business equipment, but they also have the mm -hmm. um, public version. Yeah. That's why I like it, it's free. Yep, I, for a physically separate firewall, PFSense is awesome. I've done a talk on it before here, I think. Mm -hmm. um, Host-wise, IP tables. So in terms of firewalls, oftentimes the answer to which is the most secure is which is the most extensively tested. Mm -hmm. And so things like IP tables can win out, or PF on BSD can win out, because it's Time tested. Netgear will kill you too because Netgear, there are vulnerabilities right now. People aren't upgrading. I'm not firmware. thrilled with Netgear. Yeah. No, the home routers. That the yeah. most popular uh, security vulnerability is not upgrading their firmware. Yeah, Netgear is not great home routers. I know. And the other thing I was thinking about, like in terms of internet security, what if what do you think of Comcast and killing someone's internet remotely? I don't have a high opinion of Comcast either. <laughs> you must have are, them for I'm going to go ahead and stress these are my opinions, not Google's. <laughs> I, I know, I know. Yeah, because you, you had your hand up though, right? Uh, yeah, so there are two questions from our Slack channel for people that cannot attend. Uh, one is what threat model you use? Yeah, I might need elaboration on that because a threat model is very dependent on the work being done, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're Google, having the National Security Agency trying to attack you is in the threat model. But if you are the SPCA or the Red Cross, eh, maybe actually, because the Red Cross has overseas activities, um, APT might be a concern to them. If you're like Bob's widgets, probably not. Okay. So threat model-wise, it, it's I, I would need more context probably behind that. And the second question is, what certifications would you recommend for getting a job uh, in incidents response, CCNA, OSCP, CISSP? So this, I have mixed feelings about the CISSP. <laughs> and my mixed feelings are, as an engineer who's been in the field a very long time, I don't see a lot of actual educational value coming out of the CISSP if you attain one. But many of the jobs you might want are defense industry, large corporate, uh, you know, big business that aren't tech industry. And if you don't have a network of connections, if you don't have <laughs> someone personally like advocating for you to get a job, CISSP can really help you get a foot in the door in those organizations. 
So I don't tell people not to get a CISSP. I just say don't rely on that for your skills. Um, with that big caveat, in incident response and forensics, I am really fond of SANS 408, uh, which is basic forensics. 508 is advanced forensics and incident response. It's when they first begin putting the IR component in. There's, of course, 504, which is called, I think, Hacker Tips, Tricks, and Exploits. That's part incident response and part understanding compromise chain. And I think those three form a really solid underpinning of skills for an incident response type job. Um, you get good forensic analysis, you get good incident response, and you get a good overall perspective. So 408, 504, and 508. Sorry, one last question here just popped. Um, so what book non-infosec would you recommend that would help in infosec? Ooh, what non-infosec book would I help that recommends in infosec? That's a good question. Um, there are so many different ones that I would have to say. There's a really dry, difficult to get through book called Human Error, <laughs> which is a, um, it's a research book that was done on the ways that human beings fail. Mm -hmm. And if you can get through it, it's not a book on InfoSec, but boy, does it apply. Uh, because an awful lot of InfoSec problems turn out to be human error and foresight problems. Okay. So I think I would go with that one. Thank you. Other than that, Neuromancer is pretty good. If you haven't read Neuromancer, you should totally read it. It's awesome. It's no crash. And how about a book on um, incident response? Book on incident response? Um, I don't know. There's, there's a couple of books on incident response. I'm not enamored with any particular ones. I actually think um, there's a series called Hacking Exposed, which if you get the latest edition, I think actually provides you with more fundamentals that you'll use in incident response, just because you're knowing the attack side of things and you're knowing what to prepare for. Other than that, like the, the, the really hardcore incident management skills, you probably shouldn't worry about those until you've been through the technical fire for a few years. and and understand that side of the house. Cool. Any more tools you're going to develop on, you know, web-based, you know, diagnostics, like, you know, we have speedtest.net or fast.com. I don't know. Google's out. got like 100,000 people. There's probably one just got finished while we were talking. <laughs> I can't keep up. Oh. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. It was good right. talking to everybody. Uh, I hope this was useful. If you start your own mail server, um, you can email me at musicgoogle.com and be like, check out my domain. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and of course, it's extra credit. You should show it to us. Yes. Yeah, get extra credit for their showing us their DMARC record. Yeah, yeah well, show us your email server. See how it goes. Yeah. I know Kirk did years ago. He made the IPv6 one. That's cool. I went yeah, through the, the, the same college. thing for the IPv6 certification. We learned how to set up a bunch of servers. And that was really very good. You know, everybody got to use it. So he, maybe you should tell Sam he should be teaching IPv6 at least once for the cyber competition or try to you know, get some people to work for you. Right? Do you think that would help? IPv6 is really good skill to have, but once you understand IP, UDP, TCP, all of the stack, the kernel, and the software, then bring in like, OK, now I can do all these things. Let me do them on an IPv6 network. Because no one's really teaching it anymore. It's IPv6 is just larger masks, more space, and a bunch of auto-config protocols that you will care about if you become a networking expert. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good seeing you again, Sam. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you. See you all later. Yeah. All, right. all right, so I'll, I'll clean up. I'll go up to the lab and uh, <laughs> see if there's any up? help on anything here. Uh, any of you guys can do the mail server? Probably one. Uh, yeah, you're right. I should pass around the chat. Yeah, the sign issue.